This morning's Gospel reading is taken from Luke 18, verses 18 to 30. The rich and the kingdom of God. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, No one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, will fail to receive many times as much in this age, and this age to come, eternal life. This is the Gospel of Christ. Father, I pray this morning that you will help me to say, what you want me to say so that everyone here will be able to go home knowing that they've heard your voice. Amen. About 45 years ago at a New Year's home fellowship meeting out of doors by a swimming pool. We shared a time of fellowship and for whatever reason I don't remember, the Lord gave us that reading we've just heard from Zachariah. And I don't know about you, but the Lord speaks to me most deeply through the simple things of life simple experiences, little things that happen and they immediately attract our attention and we think, wow, Lord, what you say? This was an occasion like that and the particular passage in question, I'll just read again for you. God was speaking through Zechariah about his concern to restore Jerusalem and this is the theme of restoration, which is our theme today. This is what the Lord Almighty says. And this was after a time of bondage and disunion, fraction amongst people. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem 
each with cane in hand because of his age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. I don't know about you, but for me that was a, a beautiful picture. It was so simple and it just spoke to me of everything that restoration is all about in terms of what God is engaged in, in restoring his fallen, fallen creation. Bringing together people who've been divided, tormented, hurt and destroyed. And old men with their canes, with children are playing in the streets around their feet. It's such a simple picture, but the Lord spoke to me and said, that is what I'm about in restoring my kingdom. And you are part of it if you belong to me. In contrast, we think of the scenes of television which are confronting us every day. Last night, I noticed particularly in the news, scenes of devastation through war. Cities and towns that have been beautiful, totally laid waste. And God is in the business of restoring everything that is spoiled. Another verse from Isaiah chapter 11, which will be known to all of you. Again, speaking on this great theme of restoration. One day, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the co cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. What a wonderful, wonderful picture of future glory when God fully restores his kingdom, his creation. Becoming a Christian means so much more than a free passage to heaven when I die. You may remember that Arthur, you said two weeks ago that you were going to talk about heaven and you said to us all that you didn't know very much about heaven because you'd never been there. Well, I would say that's absolutely true of me as well. I don't know an awful lot about heaven because I've never been there. Surprisingly, listen to this verse which is undoubtedly the most well-known verse of scripture from John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Do you notice that heaven isn't even mentioned? When we give our hearts to Jesus, the promise that we receive from him is that we are born again into a new kingdom, a new life altogether. We will have eternal life. And what many Christians, I think, don't fully realize is that eternal life starts now. It starts the moment we give our hearts to Jesus and we are born again of the Holy Spirit. And we begin to see things with a spiritual dimension. Born into God's kingdom, we become children of the King. And Jesus introduces us to God as our Heavenly Father. It's the most wonderful thing of all. Jesus came to bring us into a living relationship with God our Father where we know him and love him and are able to respond to his love for us. Born again into God's kingdom. 
There's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and it goes on into chapter 2 where Paul is speaking about the, the simple fact that the natural person, the person who has not been born again by the Spirit, if you like, the person whose spirit is not alive to God, cannot understand the things of the Spirit because they are spiritually discerned. So if ever you wonder why people who aren't Christians don't understand spiritual truths, that's the reason. It's because they have not been born again by the Spirit of God. Some of you older folk like me may remember a book called Nine O'Clock in the Morning, written by an Episcopalian rector, Dennis Dennis Bennett and he likened his experience of being newly awakened to the Spirit of God. He was a rector of a parish but that didn't make much difference. He said he had an experience of the Holy Spirit which awakened him, spirit, soul and body, to the reality of God's love. And he said the transformation was instant and it was like the change between waking up in the morning and saying, oh, good God, morning. And saying, good morning, God. The sky was brighter, it was blue. Everything changed. And that's what happens in one way or another when we are born again of the Spirit. We begin to see God and his whole creation in an entirely new way. Things that we'd never seen before suddenly hit us and we think, wow. Just last night, Beth was looking at a, a raspberry plant in a pot outside our back door that my daughter had given us last year. And it was dead, she thought, and she was just about to throw it out. And she saw from the dead branch of the tree a little green shoot coming up. And we've decided to give it another chance because God is in the business of restoration. That is God, that is the way he works. And so we see creation when we're born again in a new way. And this is both good and bad. We see the wonder of God's creation in a new way. But we also see the destruction that humankind has wrought in God's creation. And that fills anyone who's born again of the Spirit with a deep sadness, but also a longing to work with God to restore what has been so sadly destroyed through sin, man's rebellion against God. Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples and the crowds on the Sermon on the Mount, was trying to explain to them the wonder of God in caring for his children. And he said, why do you care about this? Why do you care about that? Why do you worry about the food you'll live, have? Why do you worry about the clothes you'll put on? God is much bigger than that. Don't you know that he cares for you? And then he said a very interesting thing, which is recorded only specifically in Matthew's Gospel. He said, but you, you who want to serve God, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Wouldn't you think that Jesus, in wanting to bring people into a close relationship with God, would say, look, seek God first. Put God first in your life. That's what really matters. But he didn't say that. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. That kingdom which we have been born into through the Holy Spirit. And when a Christian begins to seek the kingdom of God all around wherever he or she may be, and they see people whose lives reflect something of the love of God because they're born again of the Spirit, and their lives point to a different king, to the king that the world serves and honors, there is a little microcosm of the kingdom of God. It shows us that we are caught up with God in his kingdom to be workers with him 
for the restoration of his kingdom. And I think often we don't realize that. We think it's all up to God. Oh God, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do that? But God says, you are working with me to restore my creation. And I would have to say this in the last couple of months, that's been the major challenge that God's been bringing to me. That's why I wanted to share about restoration this morning. But it's restoration and encouragement, not judgment, folks. If we belong to the Lord, it's restoration and encouragement. I know that Sharon has read that wonderful passage from Romans 18, but I want to do something which a preacher shouldn't do, and that is read it all again, but in a different version, because this really speaks to me, and hopefully it will speak to you. Paul writing concerning the future glory of God's kingdom. And these are in the words of a paraphrase, um, Paul Langham, who's a, the, my granddaughter's vicar in Bristol. Romans 8, 18. Don't think for a moment that present suffering and future glory are comparable. What we suffer now is hardly worth mentioning compared with the glory to come. Did you know that the whole cosmos is straining to see what God has in store for us, his children? Human rebellion has affected the whole of creation. But one day it will be set free from its chains, shake off the curse of decay, and share the wonderful freedom which God has in store for us. Our world is like a woman in labor her constant groaning, the result of human injustice and oppression, greed and hatred, her contractions, the natural disasters which rack her as she longs to be delivered. All those who have God's Holy Spirit living inside them share that same longing as we await final adoption as his children when the world will be restored and made perfect. Now listen to this, we'll have new bodies, all dressed up and everywhere to go. This is the hope we have in Jesus, a guaranteed future in God's new creation. We can't yet see it, so we wait patiently in hope. As Christians we are caught up with God in all that he is doing to restore creation. And in this restoration, God is putting right everything that sin has spoiled. And he trusts us to work with him in this creation. And immediately I read that, the challenge comes to me, Peter, does my life do that? Does your life do that? Does it work with God to demonstrate his creation power, his restoration power, and his great love for his creation? You know, the Bible has been called many different things. It's been called a book of invitation, which it surely is, because on almost every page of the scriptures, in one way or another, God is saying to his lost people, come, why don't you come? Come to me, I love you. All through the scriptures you'll find the message of invitation. But it's also a book of redemption, where we see from, right from the moment of the fall of man, Adam and Eve, God didn't give up on them, but he worked and is working to restore everything that has fallen. And so we can also say that the Bible is, and this is perhaps more important than anything, it's a book of rescue and of restoration. That's what God is committed to. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, however you interpret that, it's wonderful picture language. And it describes the human condition when we say, God, no. 
It's my life, it's what I want to do that matters, so I'm sorry, God, keep your distance. We may not say that in words, but in our attitudes, we say it again and again and again. And so from the moment we disobeyed God, first of all, the moment we identify ourselves with Adam and Eve, God has been working not in judgment to us, but to restore us with great longing and with tears. The Bible is a book of restoration supremely. A shorter quote this time from Tom Wright, who's a great New Testament scholar, who has the ability to write to ordinary people like you and me. When he's writing academic stuff, he is described as N.T. Wright. Um, when he's writing to you and me, he's described as Tom Wright. And his books are very different. The day the revolution began, and I'd have to confess that Beth read it and been thrilled by it. I haven't got into it yet, but she gave me this quotation which is so relevant for what we're thinking about this morning. The hope of Israel expressed in the Pentateuch and the prophets and the Psalms was not for a rescue operation that would snatch Israel or humans or the faithful from the world but for a rescue operation that would be for the world. An operation through which redeemed human beings would play once more the role for which they were designed. That is to say, working with God in restoring the kingdom. And there is the challenge that I've already mentioned. See, in Genesis chapter 1, we know that everything was good that God made. Again and again and again, with every act of creation, we read, and God said it was good. Adam and Eve, between them, very soon spoiled all that, and they hid from God because they knew they were done. They knew what they'd done. And the consequences of that sin or that rebellion, because that's what sin is, it's rebellion against God. No longer would they have access to the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't know about you, but I just love the picture language of the Bible because pictures speak so much more clearly and they speak to every generation. You know, I've often thought if the story of creation was written in terms which were scientifically acceptable and understandable today, it means that every generation that lived before, it would have just been gobbledygook. They wouldn't have understood a word of it. How typical of God that he gives us a story of creation which in its picture language is meaningful and unalterable to every generation that's ever lived. Have you ever realized that? before you criticize the story of generation, the story of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. So the, through rebellion, Adam and Eve lost access to the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And from that moment on, the restoration which we're talking about today begins. Instead of dismissing and starting again, God says, no, I won't restore what I have created. Why? Because what he created was absolutely perfectly good. And he's working to restore it. And so it continues throughout the Bible. There isn't time to go through all the references. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. But this is the message of the Bible. Come to me. Come back to me, my children. I love you. We see the final summary of all that in the very end of Revelation. When God restores Israel and he restores his people, they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain. 
for the old order of things has passed away. And then in the scripture, Genesis 22, the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. You see, the access to the tree of life for you and me and all the redeemed, all those who are kingdom children of God, the access to the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is once again made available to us all through what God has done in restoration, principally through Jesus coming to save us and rescue us and bring us back to him. The Spirit and the Bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the fruit, the free gift, of the water of life. In Hebrews 11.13 we have what's commonly known as the roll call of the faithful, describing those like Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham and many others. And once again the paraphrase written by Paul Langham, faith inspired all of them to die in mid-stride, still going strong. They didn't see the fulfillment of their hopes, but they never lost sight of God's promises on the horizon and shaped their lives around them. They never saw this world as home. Jesus made that clear in John 17, that this world is not our home, but we are part of God's kingdom, which is both now and not yet. We are children of the King, and the King is our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. Well, I haven't preached on the Gospel for today, but I just wanted to end with a, just a brief comment on the Gospel from Luke 18 and verses 29 and 30. Jesus said to his disciples, he said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come. And that was his response to the disciples saying, Lord, we have left everything to follow you. And instead of saying, oh no, you haven't, which they could argue about. He didn't answer the question that way. He said, if you've left everything, God knows, and you will receive your reward. And the ultimate reward is eternal life. And so to be working with God to restore his kingdom through the power of the Holy Spirit is what Jesus died for and what we have been saved for. Amen. Father, I pray that each one of us might have a new understanding of what it means to be children of the kingdom with all the responsibilities that you give us and for which you trust us to work with you in that great work of restoration. Amen.